Hi, and uh, welcome back uh, uh, to um, this first of the presentations that I'm doing here at the South Coast Senior Center this year. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I work at Myrick O'Connell uh, there. There are 60 of us, no, there are 70 of us there. We are actually, I found out, the biggest law firm outside of Boston. Um, and everybody, because there's 70 of us, everybody gets to do what they like, and so I like this. Uh, I like doing elder law. I like it because my clients still think I'm young. I have no client under 55. My median client age is 74. And the purpose of these presentations is to really give you a sense of what the issues are that you need to be thinking about as a senior, if you're like my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, you've seen them before, my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people their goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die, and they want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, now, it, what I decided for this year's iteration of this presentation, I, I try to do, every spring I try to do uh, uh, two general seminars, one this one, which is really elder law for couples, and then one, the next one, which is elder law for singles, and then I do more special ones in the spring, or in the fall, rather. But I decided for this one, I would really get, talk about Frank and Mary at two different ages. At first, I'm going to talk about them at 65, and then I'm going to talk about them at 80, because some of their estate planning issues change over time. They get older. And oftentimes, I'll talk to some folks who are 80 who did their documents and stuff at age 8, 65, and I'm amazed to find out that the documents don't work for what they want them to work for because their needs have changed. So Frank and Mary, if they are 65, really need to be thinking about three things. They need to be thinking about what happens if they have short-term incapacity. Somebody has a stroke, somebody falls down and gets hurt. All the things that can happen to you at any age, but it just happens more often, <laughs> right? The older you get. So short-term incapacity, probate avoidance. How do I make sure that we can avoid the probate process? I'm going to talk about that for a while. And estate tax minimization. So if you're 65 the, and you come in and you tell me, oh, God, you know what? I haven't done our documents for a long time. I really need a new will. And, I'll tell folks, you know, the, the will actually isn't the really important document. Among other things, as I'm going to mention later, if you die, uh, if, and chances are if you're Frank and Mary, you own everything jointly, so that if one of you dies, that person's interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. But if that's not the case, even, and you die and you don't have a will, and your goal is when you die, you're going to leave everything to your spouse, and then if the both of you are dead, you're going to leave everything to your kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., then that's exactly what happens if you don't have a will. That's exactly what happens. And the fact that you have a will doesn't avoid the probate process, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so th the will isn't the really important thing. Actually, it's health care proxy and power of attorney. Those are the two things you have to have, because if you get incapacitated and you don't have those, some really bad things happen. Like, no one can make your medical decisions for you. People think that their spouse can make medical decisions for them. Technically, that's not true. Doctors and hospitals have often let that go and allowed that to happen. But in an increasingly litigious world, and I can tell you, Mario O'Connell, we do all the medical malpractice defense for the UMass system. We're, we're a big firm. I tell you, things are, people get nervous about this stuff now, right? And you're not going to get decisions made, you know, if someone doesn't have a health care proxy. And, and somebody needs to be able to handle your legal affairs through a power of attorney. So, those two basic documents. First of all, raise your hand. How many people here have a health care proxy? That's great. How many people here know where it is? Oh, that's good too. That's a lot more than usual. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So, health care proxy. Just to remind you, in order to do one, you need two witnesses. The witnesses can be anybody uh, except the person you're naming as the proxy. It can be that person's spouse. It can be that person's kids. It can be anybody. Remember, it only takes effect when you're incapacitated. What does that mean? It's when your doctor says you can't make a medical decision. That's the only time it takes effect. And it only affects medical decisions. A person who has a health care proxy can't make any other decision for you except a health care decision. Um, you can only have one agent at a time. If I'm the doctor and you're incapacitated and I want to know what to do, I don't want to hear two kids arguing about it, right? I want to, I want to talk to one person, so you can only name one person at a time. Um, in addition to having your health care proxy, how many people have actually talked to their proxy about how they want to be treated if they're incapacitated? Raise your hand. 
Well, that's actually a lot. Um, the, statistic, the, the statistics are that 75 to 80 percent of Americans say that they should do that, <laughs> and about 20 percent of Americans have done it, right, for the folks who have got a health care proxy. So a couple of uh, advices on the health care proxy. First of all, tell them, tell the person you've named, right, if you go to the hospital here at, in Marlboro, or I was just doing a presentation in Nantucket, another community where I go, um, and the person who is in head, head of social services there said, of the people who come in the door and they're incapacitated and they call the proxy, because they've got the proxy, about 20% of the people they call say, I am? I'm the proxy? Right, well that's not good. That's not good in an emergency, right? Um, but that, that's the first thing. But the second thing is you need to have this kind of conversation. Now, I'm probably gonna be, I'm gonna be working more on this later on in the year and that may be one of the fall presentations. But there are, there are three places that people go when they're starting to think about this. One is a form called the Five Wishes form, which really talks about what your wishes are for your care if you're like on the verge of death, right? If things are really, really, really bad. Um, uh, then there's um, the Conversations Project, which is really a project designed, actually developed by somebody here in uh, Massachusetts. It's now nationwide. It's part of the Institute for Healthcare Initiatives or Healthcare Improvement. It is designed to encourage you to have a broader conversation with the person that you've named as your proxy. And, and to answer some questions, so I'll give you the example. Suppose you have a stroke, right? We're all at the age we could have a stroke, right? Um, you have a stroke and now you're incapacitated, you can't communicate your decision. And that's the way you're gonna stay. And then, and you've been like that for a while, and then you get pneumonia. And the doctor, and they can bring you, to, because you're at home, right, or you're in a, you're, or you're in a facility, but you're, you can go to the hospital and we'll guarantee you they'll cure the pneumonia. Except that's all they're gonna cure, and then you're gonna get back and that's, you're gonna be back where you were, right, in terms of your condition. In that case, do you wanna go to the hospital? Do you really wanna go to the hospital? Maybe you do, or maybe you don't. But the point is, if you're not capable of saying it, your proxy needs to know that. So they need to know, not specifics, because you can't you know, predict specifics into the future, but they need to understand what those values are that you have about what living is, so they can make correct decisions about how you want to be treated. What if you've got a treatment that's going to involve a lot of nausea, right? I know for myself, I always say, you know, I can live with a bad memory. I can deal with that, right? Pain, not so much. Nausea, forget it. If somebody told me, I was gonna be nauseous for the rest of my life. And they said, well, you could, and you can live for a week or you can live for a year. Guess what, I'm taking the week, you know? So that person needs to know that. That's an important decision you make. When you name that person, that's an important decision. That's replacing you for the rest of your life if you're incapacitated. I'm sorry if I get wound up about this, but this is really important. So that's what the Conversation Project is and the Honoring, and the honoring Choices Program really is a kind of a more sophisticated version of the five wishes uh, and of, because it really gives you this ability to talk about these kinds of questions as they, as, they might result, as they might relate to the rest of your life if you've got a lot of life left to live, right? So they're really important. So, uh, as I mentioned, does your proxy know who they are, right? Um, where do you put your proxy? Um, the best place to have it is, is uh, with your doctor uh, it, because if, and if you give your doctor your health care proxy your doctor is required under state law to put it into your medical record so that if you end up in a hospital no matter where the hospital the doctor can always email them the health care proxy and so that gets taken care of um, remember by the way that that oh and remember the one that you signed when you went to the hospital like you went to the emergency room and they said oh you have to sign this proxy in order for us to talk to you and you think that therefore they've still got that? No, they don't. They threw that away. When you left the hospital, they threw that away. And by the way, incidentally, this is the lawyer in me, as, a, as one of the pieces of the healthcare proxy law is that every time you sign a proxy, you have automatically revoked all your previous ones. So the moment you signed that proxy in the emergency room, you actually revoked the one you had in your draw at home. And now they've thrown that one away. <laughs> so, you just need to be aware of that. The best place to have these really is in your doctor's office, and they're required to take them and to put them into your medical record, okay? Uh, power of attorney. As opposed to a proxy, 
Oh, excuse me, proxy, you don't need any notarization or any of that jazz either. I'm going to answer all questions at the end because I want to make sure I get to the end because otherwise I forget. Right? Uh, power of attorney, um, you do not need any witnesses. You actually don't even need a notary. Um, but you always, oh, you don't need any witnesses if the power of attorney is dealing just with Massachusetts property. The point of a power of attorney is that you're giving somebody the power to do all of the legal things that you can do. And people will often see that term and say, but wait a minute, you're an attorney. Well, I'm a special kind. I'm an attorney at law. That, that, that means that I'm one, in order for me to say something on your behalf in front of a judge, I have to be an attorney at law, right? But for all other decisions, all other places where you could be represented by somebody, that can be anybody you want. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. That's what a power of attorney is. It names somebody to act on your behalf as your agent. So you don't need uh, witnesses. Notary is preferred. The only time the notary is needed is if the attorney is signing a deed for you, transferring the house for you, signing a mortgage, which your attorney would have the ability to do. He has the ability to sign everything that you could sign, right? Um, in that case, the document has to be notarized because the power of attorney will have to get recorded and re in the registry, and they will only take notarized documents. Um, you always want it to be notarized, though. The reason is because most people don't know that. Um, if you gave somebody a power of attorney that wasn't notarized, literally at the bank, they're going to go, no, ah, this isn't even notarized. I don't know if this is legal, right? Well, it is, but nobody knows that. And so you're really only doing the notarization so that it'll look legal. I know that sounds like a stupid reason, but the point is you want them to take it, right? My, my, many years ago, my daughter, who was now a big-time lawyer at Wilmer Hale, um, uh, gave me a T-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the bad, or the great lawyer knows the judge. The point is, in this case, the judge is like the guy at the bank, you know, or your insurance guy that you call who says, oh, I don't know about this power of attorney. So you want it to look like a real legal document. Um, you can name more than one person at the same time as your attorney. So many people, especially if they're naming, if you, will name like their spouse and one of their kids jointly and severally so that their spouse can always take care of it, but if their spouse isn't around or if the spouse is sick or whatever, now the daughter can take care of it or the, whoever the other person is. And, and, and if he says jointly and severally as opposed to just jointly, any one of the people you name can be the, can be the proxy. And, and, re, and regarding powers of attorney as opposed to uh, proxies, doing a new one doesn't revoke the old one. So if you, you're in this situation where you've named somebody in a power of attorney, but now you kind of don't trust them, you know, or maybe they're not around, but like you're kind of worried about them, and so you do a new power of attorney to a new person, uh, what you also should do is send that first one something revoking your power of attorney. Send them something in writing saying you're revoking the power of attorney. And also, if, if go to your local bank where you have accounts, and tell them, give them a copy of that document that said you revoked the first power of attorney. Because otherwise, that first person could go to the bank and still take all the money. Uh, be, and the reason for that is there's a pretty standard provision in powers of attorney really meant to make sure that somebody can really use the power of attorney. And it says that anybody that I, that if I'm the attorney, anybody that I present that power of attorney to, if I also give them a sworn statement, an affidavit, a lot of times notarized, right? that says that the power of attorney is still in effect and that, and that my, my agent is not dead, right? The, the bank in that case or anybody else is, will accept that power of attorney because it will say right in the power of attorney, that person dealing with me now has no liability if I'm lying, right? And the reason for that is that otherwise no one would ever take a power of attorney, right? Because I'd go into the bank with this power of attorney from my mother and the guy would say, well, how do I know it hasn't been revoked? I can't prove it hasn't been revoked, right? So it's always in there, which means if you really want to revoke it, you want to tell the people that this person you may not trust anymore might use the power of attorney with that the power of attorney has been revoked, okay? Um, power of attorney provisions. I've, raise your hand if you've got a power of attorney. Raise your hand. Oh, a little less than half. You ought to have that power of attorney. If you do, um, it's going to be this, often this kind of long document, and you've never read it, right? You just did it. I mean, you signed it, you got it off a of Zoom, or your lawyer did it for you. You don't know what it says. So go back and read it and see if it has these three things. First, if you own real estate, see if it says that your attorney can sign deeds and other real estate documents, because if it doesn't, they can't. Okay? Second, 
if you, like many of my clients, are doing this in order to make sure that if one of you gets sick and, needs to, and we need to restructure assets for mass health qualification purposes, you want to you, you make sure that your attorney in that case, often your spouse, has the ability to transfer assets to himself or to herself from you to get things out of your name. If, if that has to be in the power of attorney, otherwise a person can't do that. There's a general presumption that an attorney can't make gifts to himself, <laughs> right? Can't use the power of attorney to steal everything. And so if you can make gifts to yourself, that needs to be in there. Um, uh, finally, financial limitations. Many of the older powers of attorney that were done by folks who were really doing estate plans that were only dealing with uh, financial issues um, would have a gifting clause that says the attorney can give things away, but there will all often be a cap. It'll say the gifts can't be an amount greater than the annual federal tax exclusion, or something like that. Um, if that's in there and I'm trying to move assets around on, be on behalf of one spouse by giving them to the other and I can only give them away, give away this year $15,000, that doesn't help me. I've had that situation occur where I couldn't get somebody qualified for mass health because I couldn't shift the assets out of the sick spouse's name because of course they were incompetent to do a new power of attorney and there was nobody, there was, there was nothing that could give, there was, they had a power of attorney that they thought was fine except they could only give away $15,000 and I, I needed to transfer the house, right? So it was really a problem. So, you want to go back and look at your power of attorney, see if it has those three things. Um, so that's the first thing that, that Frank and Mary want to do. They want to have a healthcare proxy and they want to tell their, their proxy who it is. They want to have a power of attorney, right? Uh, and now they want to talk to me about estate planning. And they think they just want to talk about this will issue, right? But as I mentioned to you, uh, if, they, if, if their goal is to leave everything to their spouse and then everything to their kids, they really don't need a will. So the real question is, is that really what they want to do, right? And so there are some questions that I'd be asking them at that point regarding that. So first of all, do any of your kids have creditor problems? Because if they do, and you leave them something, you're really leaving it to the creditors, right? Or if they have IRS problems or whatever, because that pile of money is going to get grabbed by somebody. Do they have spouse problems? God knows you don't want to leave this money to the daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place. Right? And so you don't want to leave them the money and all of a sudden there's a divorce and the money is part of your, your son's pile and getting divided up with that daughter, that daughter-in-law, oh my God, right? And third, um, you don't want to inadvertently exclude your children from the ability to qualify for a government program. So if you've got a, a son or a daughter who has some cognitive issues or other medical issues who may already be on Mass Health, for example, or on SSI, or other government programs that are means tested, by giving them a lot of assets, you may be automatically disqualifying them for those programs. Or Section 8, the big housing program, right? So you don't want, in those cases, what you'd want to do is have a will and have the will say, um, this, presumably, presuming that you wanted to use the will as, a, as your estate planning device, have the will say that the assets that were going to go to that child who has the problem are instead going to go and trust for the benefit of that child. So in the Peter, Paul, and Mary case, if Peter's got a problem, you could name Paul or Mary as the trustee for the benefit of Peter. As long as Peter doesn't have the right to pull those assets out of those trusts, the creditors can't get to them, the spouse can't get to them, and, it, and, the, and that fact does not disqualify him from government benefits, right? So you, there may be reasons why you want to have you want to have a will because you've got to deal with an issue like this, right? Um, other kinds of issues that you're dealing with, if you're, whether you're dealing with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, a will or other documents, you want to make sure that you're clear on who is running things after you die. You want to make sure there's some named person, probably a personal representative, that used to be called the executor or the executrix under the will. Uh, you don't want to name two people to do something unless you've named a tiebreaker. You never want an even number of people because if they disagree, the tiebreaker becomes the probate judge. And now you've got a big expense. Everyone's running to probate to get this, the question answered. Um, you want to make sure you're avoiding ambiguity regarding who gets what. If there are particular items of tangible personal property, the stuff around the house, the second car, the John Deere tractor, the guns, the jewelry, any of those things where you've got a specific person that you want to have get that, you can list that actually in a separate document 
referred to in the will, and, that, and the person running the, everything is required to abide by that. But you want to be specific. Which gun? Which ring? All of those things, right? You, you want to, um, regarding houses, regarding houses, if you have a house and your will simply says, oh, we're going to divide it equally, I'm going to divide all my assets equally among my kids, that means your house. And that means that if the house doesn't get sold during the probate process, that, that the house gets transferred to all of your kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. But now they all own it. So now what do you do? So now, and what if, what if one of them is living in it and the other two want to sell it? Or what's the rent going to be? Well, you know, what if they all want to sell it, but one person thinks, oh God, it's South Bro, it's worth a million dollars, you know? And somebody else says, no, actually, the market's about 500,000. How do you resolve that? You don't, because everybody has to sign the deed. Now everyone has to go to a court to do a forced sale of the property. So if what you really mean is, I want the house sold and the proceeds distributed, then that's what you want to say in your document. I want the house sold and the proceeds distributed. Okay? Uh, house, we just talked a little bit about house occupancy. If you do want somebody to stay living in the house, you really want to make the terms clear. What's the, you know, can that person have company, right? Can that person have a partner and other kids? And can that person leave the house and rent it out? And, it, and, and how do you determine whether that person has left the house for long enough and has rented it? How do you figure out all of that stuff? That needs to be in a document. A lot of times what I recommend in that case is that you actually say that the person who's in control of the house is actually going to do a lease with that person. And the lease is going to have all these terms in it. That the tenants, that the, your child is going to make sure they pay the taxes and the insurance and keep up the heat and all that jazz. And that otherwise the lease ends and you can sell the house and everyone doesn't have to run to court, okay? So you want to be kind of clear on house. Um, grandchildren, I'll just mention to you what I mentioned to a client about an hour ago who was in saying, you know, we've got, and they had fairly substantial assets, a little under two million, and they wanted to make sure they had done something for his grandchildren, he said, like taking care of their education. And I mentioned to him, I said, that's great. Remember though, if you're giving the money to your grandchildren, you may be really giving it to Harvard because when, you're, when your grandchild applies to Harvard and fills in the FAFSA form, the, the form that the federal government requires regarding any federal loans, and that most colleges also take, they're going to subtract dollar for, for dollar from that child's student aid how much they have in their own account, right? Dollar for dollar. They're going to figure, hey, he can afford, there's the money, right? So he can afford it for his tuition, there's the money, right? Even if it's in trust for his benefit to pay for his education. Whereas if, it, if the parents have the money, uh, while this formula varies, colleges will typically say that each dollar that the parent has, they'll say for every five dollars the parent has, they'll attribute one dollar to an amount that, would be, that they could pay for that child's college. That varies. But the point is, you give it to the child, typically those dollars get subtracted dollar for dollar from, from uh, college. Probate avoidance. Why would Frank and Mary want to avoid probate? As I explained to you, um, probate would accomplish exactly what they want to have accomplished, right? It would end up making sure that when Frank dies, everything goes to Mary and vice versa, and after that, everything goes to the kids. Well, the answer, to understand that, you have to understand the point of probate, right? The point of probate is to make sure that if you die owning an asset just in your own name, somebody can figure out who gets it. Right? If you die on owning an asset that's jointly held with somebody else, then upon your death, your interest evaporates, the other person gets it. If you die and you have an IRA or a 401 account or a most brokerage accounts or many bank accounts that have a TOD provision, a transfer on death provision, or a POD, a pay on death provision, then upon your death, those people are going to get the asset. If you die and you don't have anybody, and this is often the case if, I've, if there are single people who simply own a house, right? or someone has maybe inherited a house from their family and so it's just in that spouse's name. There are a number of reasons, or you have a bank account that's like that. In that case, somebody needs to figure out who gets that asset and that's what probate is for, right? And, and, and if you have a will, then the person who gets the asset is the person who's named in the will. If you don't have a will, then there are these other rules that apply, which I went through. Uh, basically, the rules of intestacy, basically the government's will that they've written for you, never goes to the state, never goes to the state. As I've, I've been doing this for 42 years. I have one mantra, if there's money, there's always a relative. Always, always, always. There'll be a second cousin once removed. There's somebody. We're now doing a house. We're doing a house. 
we're doing a house sale for a guy that we found in Ireland who was found by a person who does like, like, like uh, um, air searches regarding property in the city of Boston that are in tax title. And he found it was in, and it was in, Do is in, uh, is it in Dorchester? Yeah, it's in Dorchester. Uh, so there's this guy who died with no family, dropped dead on vacation in Maine, dropped dead, single, no kids, nothing, right? I inherited the house from his aunt. The aunt didn't have any kids, right? Now it's in tax title and it's falling apart and we get contacted and blah, 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 blah. So now we start searching around because he had found, this, the air search guy had found one cousin in Ireland, a genuine Irish guy, right? Uh, so we found the Irish guy and it turns out there were a couple of other cousins and now we're going through this whole game, you know, and there's a, you know, we're getting, actually the, the one cousin is actually having to drive to the house of the other cousins next week to get the thing signed. But, but you can't get it, I can't get it notarized because these people are all in Ireland. So then one guy has to go to the consulate in Ireland and get somebody from the consulate to sign a special document and blah, blah, blah. And then we're going to get, and now it's, and then it's set and we're going to sell it. The point is there's always a relative, always, always a relative. So um, the reason to avoid probate though uh, is not so much that, right? It's that probate is meant for something else. It's to make sure the creditors get paid. Before any distributions to anybody, uh, first you've got to pay the creditors. And the law is in Massachusetts that creditors have one year from date of death to file a claim against the probate estate. That is why all probates in Massachusetts have to take at least a year. Because you can't distribute until the creditor period is done. And I know you will say, but I don't have any creditors. But the answer is, how does the rest of the world know that? The only way that we know is by waiting that year. Because at the end of that year, if they didn't file, even if they were creditors, they're gone, which means you can now distribute. So if people want to av avoid that, or they want to avoid the, uh, the um, and remember, wills do not avoid probate. They simply tell what happens at the end of the year, right? Um, if you want to avoid the legal cost, and there is, because, because it's a painful, not painful, it's a, it's a hassle going through the probate process. And if you, if you try to do it yourself, it's, you're going to get buried trying to figure it out. If you use a lawyer, it's going to cost about three dollars to $10,000. So if you want to avoid, and then there's that delay. If you want to avoid that, there are a set of ways of doing it. First of all, here's a test. So here are Frank and Mary's assets. They own a house. I didn't put in there that they own it jointly. I should have. They own it jointly. Frank has an IRA uh, worth uh, $300,000. They have joint savings of $200,000. Frank has an annuity that he bought from his friend who works for an insurance company, but Mary is named as the death beneficiary. Mary has savings of $50,000. They have total assets of a million dollars. Mary dies. Mary dies. Uh, is a probate necessary? Excuse me. Frank dies. Frank dies. Is a probate necessary? Raise your hand if you think a probate is necessary. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think a probate is not necessary. Raise your hand. The Knotts have it. <laughs> Jointly owned house, which means that Mary simply gets it. There's an there's a IRA of 401k, presumably Mary's name is the death beneficiary. Joint savings, so Mary just gets it. Frank's annuity, he's already named Mary as the death beneficiary. Mary's savings is Mary's savings. She, just, she's, they already, she already owns it. So in this case, there's no probate. Um, what if Mary dies first? Need for a probate? Raise your hand if you think there is. Raise your hand if you think there isn't. The, the is has it. Mary's got that bank account in just her name. Someone's got to figure out who gets it. Okay? So you, 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 the goal of the exercise when you're figuring out how to avoid probate is to kind of go asset by asset and say, is that going to go through probate? Because you can get everything else right. For example, oftentimes people will have figured all this out regarding joint accounts. Ah, but there's the car. The car. And you die and nobody's going to buy that car unless there's a title. And the only way to change the title is by going through probate. Now, in the Frank and Mary case, that's not a problem because there is a special state statute that says if you die owning a car and you're married, uh, the, sur the surviving spouse is the presumptive joint owner of that car. So the surviving spouse can go to the registry with a death certificate and a marriage certificate and get the car transferred to them, right? That's a problem when you're single. We're going to talk about that at the next, at the next presentation. So ways to avoid probate. Joint ownership, 
we talked about that. TOD or POD, having accounts or other assets that say transfer on death or pay on death. Um, a trust, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But then my favorite, last minute giving. Last minute giving. So, so remember now, if, if you've given someone a power of attorney, you've given that person the ability, presumably, to give away things on your behalf. Remember that was one of the things that you want to be able to do? So what you may want to do is, you, you say to yourself, you're getting older, and you say, well, geez, I don't want to give away stuff now. I might need it. Yeah, that's a good point. But, you know, if you're almost dead, at that point, why not, you know? So one of the things you can do in terms of, is just tell the person who is your attorney, you give them a copy of your will and say, look, if you get the chance, before I die, distribute all the property. Here's who it goes to. And because the person has your power of attorney, they can go around and do that. They can do all the distributions, right? Now, many people will say, oh, but isn't there a gift tax? No, there isn't a gift tax. I'm going to talk about gift taxes in a little while. So there's no problem with doing that. The only issue in this case might be the house um, because you don't want to give away assets which, if you own them at the time of your death, their value for tax purposes will step up to the date of death so that the new owner can sell them capital gains tax-free. But with that exception, you can, they can always just give away the stuff or they can do a trust. So if folks come in to me and talk to me about avoiding probate, um, and often the issue is regarding the house, and they're not in the, and I tell them they're not and they're not worried about what if I die my spouse is going to get it they get that but they're saying what if we both die right and typically that's more of an issue as people get much older because the likelihood that both parents are going to die at the same time I mean I've been doing this for 42 years oh god that's a long time and 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 in those, that time there's been one case where that happened and it was a young couple actually uh, and the husband and the and the and, the, and everybody died. There, were, there was a wife and two kids, and the and the wife and the, were all in bed. And the husband came home, and 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 thought he shut off the car, and apparently didn't. It was an attached driveway, and everybody died of carbon monoxide. Right? With that one exception, it hasn't happened. However, I will tell you that early last year, it just so happened. You know, funny something. Sometimes it just happened. In two weeks, I had two sets of clients who were husband and wife, where they both died within four within four days of each other. One of them actually in a local town, town a couple towns over, that the husband, they were both in their early 90s though, and the husband fell down the stairs literally to the basement, you know, going to the laundry, and the wife was down there, so she, he fell down, He's, and, and he died, right? And four days later, she died, in the fell down in the basement, right? So as you, if you're much older, this is kind of a concern, but if you're younger, kind of not. But if it is a concern to you, the way to deal with it is you create a revocable and amendable trust. Um, it, revocable meaning anything you put into it, you can take out of it at any time. Amendable meaning you can change it at any time. You'd name both of yourselves, Frank and Mary, as the co-trustees of that trust. You would say that if one of you dies, the other one becomes the sole trustee. But then in that trust, you would name a successor when the two of you have died, probably one of the kids. And then you transfer your house to yourself, yourselves as the trustees of that trust. And if you did that, and then Frank and Mary died, um, the house would not go through probate. Instead, the new trustee would, would instantly take over as the successor, could sell the house right away, there'd be no legal fees, there'd be no delay, there'd be no one year delay, and you would have wiped out all the creditors. Um, this, this, this did, I remember doing this for a, a couple in Nantucket actually that had, they retired there, they had like seven kids, they're from Boston. And, and um, the kids were all grown up, and some of them went to law school and became lawyers, and some of them went to art school and are still looking for a job. And, but they signed the, co-signed the student loans for everybody, right? And so there's about $200,000 in student loans left and every once in a while they'll get a dunning letter, you know, but they don't have any assets, so they haven't paid. But they were concerned about their house, which they bought in Nantucket in the early 90s for $200,000, and now it's worth about a million four, right? So I said, well, you know, if you structure things this way, if you have your house in trust, uh, then when the two of you die, there's going to be nobody for the student loan folks to chase, because the student loan that is, is a debt of the estate, the probate estate of the dead person, but it wouldn't apply to the asset that was in trust. So there may be a reason to do that. So anyway, that's how you would do it. Um, estate tax avoidance. 
So let me talk to you. Let me let me start off with a brief history of the Massachusetts estate tax because you always hear about the estate tax, right? But it's like, how does that work exactly? Well, to know how it works, you got to know the history. So the Massachusetts estate tax, like the federal estate tax, kind of was invented in the early 20th century, I think in the 20s. Um, and in that time was the roaring 20s and the you know, economy was going good and people were making boatloads of money and, and, and folks were saying, you know, it just doesn't seem fair that, you know, you make, you make a lot of your money, certainly you can have it. But the notion that some lucky kid just happened to be born as your child and therefore gets a billion dollars tax free while all the rest of us are paying, you know, out of our incomes and sales tax and stuff to make the government run didn't seem fair. And so that was that was the genesis of the estate tax. And so they said at both federally and Massachusetts and in Massachusetts, they said, OK, so we're going to pick an amount. And if you die with an assets above that amount, we're going to figure you're so rich that you ought to be paying, the estate of yours should be paying something before the rest of your assets goes to your family. And then above that number, we're going to set up a graduated schedule. And we're going to say, you know, for, for if first the rate on the first chunk of money is going to be, you know, eight tenths of 1%, and the next chunk is going to be 1.6%, 1, 1. and it's going to gradually go up, right? Guess how much that amount was, the amount above which you were considered to be rich in the 1920s? $40,000. $40,000, and this is the chart that was adopted in that, at that time. And this is significant because it's still in effect. This is the same chart that they use, right? So zero to $40,000, you don't pay an estate tax. Uh, a 40,000 to 90, you pay eight tenths of 1% on that tranche of money between 40 and 90. On the piece between 90 and 140, you pay 1.6%, and then it gradually goes up. But, but, and by the way, remember now, I remember when my dad and, and, and mother bought their first and last house in Marlboro in 1940, they paid $2,000 for that house, right? It was a two-family house. They had to get a mortgage, right, and, and, and get a tenant to help support the mortgage to pay the, you know, $1,000 for the mortgage, right? So at that time, $40,000 was, was 20 times the value of a house in Marlboro, you know? So it was like a lot of money. But so that, but, and, and by the way, two relevant numbers here. According to that chart, if your asset, if your estate was a million dollars, I bet a lot of you know this figure, a million dollars, right? Um, the estate tax is $36,560. If your estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars, which is Frank and Mary's estate, there's your estate tax, $42,640. So <clears throat> what happened then, that's the estate tax, excuse me. Now, I know you weren't like dying to learn this, but isn't this kind of interesting, you know, it's, it's an interesting piece. So that's how the estate tax works. And then over time, the prices of houses went up, right? And so eventually everybody that was in the middle class that had a house was paying the estate tax, right? And so people went to the legislature and said, this isn't fair. And so the legislature responded. <clears throat> now, they could have responded by changing this chart. But I would think they just figured that was too complicated. So they didn't. And instead, they took the magic number and they changed it. They just said, instead of it being $40,000, we're going to say if you have an estate of under $100,000, you don't have to pay an estate tax. And then eventually that went up to three, and then to five, and then to six, and then about 20 years ago it went to a million. That's why you know that million dollar figure. So that if you have a million dollar estate or less, you don't pay any estate tax. So that leads though to the next question. Well, what if you have an estate of a million and one dollars? Right now, in some states, and I always use Rhode Island as the example. This was the, this was how theirs worked until about three or four years ago. There is because the, the same thing had happened. They had had this chart based on this low number, and then they had this bar that went up over time. But theirs was referred to as a cliff tax, right? So that that was kind of a joke. So because if you if you had an estate, the magic number for them was like six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Below that, no estate tax. If you're a dollar over, you fall off the cliff and you owe whatever the chart said, right? So in Massachusetts, they didn't do that exactly, but they did say, if, you, if you're rich enough, at some point we're gonna eliminate this little benefit of this first million dollars. And so in Massachusetts, if you die with an estate of a million dollars or more, you have to compute your estate tax two ways. First, you do the chart. How much would it be under the chart? Then. 
You do the alternative. What if you, you took every dollar in the taxable estate over a million and taxed it at 40 percent, 4-0? Uh, so whatever that is, so you figure that out, and then you compare the two. And whichever one is lower, that's what you owe. Okay? So Frank and Mary's case, you take the chart first, $1,100,000, the estate tax is $42,640. Then you take the alternative, take all the dollars over a million. There's $100,000 over a million at 40%. The tax is $40,000. 40,000 is lower than 42, and so that would be the estate tax when Frank and Mary died, okay? Now, as you can see, a couple of observations here. Um, as a result of that, if you're, in this, if you're around these numbers, right, between a million and a million one, Effectively, you've got a tax rate of 40% on the first $100,000, right? So you do have some incentive to get your estate down to a million, right? Um, second, as you can imagine, as pretty soon under, the, under these, this system, whoops, the lines cross. Because remember, uh, according to the chart, for assets between a million 40,000 and a million 540,000, the rate of taxation is only 6.4%. You're paying six cents on every dollar. Whereas using this system, you're paying 40 cents on every dollar, right? So very quickly, this 40 cents on a dollar is catching up with the other one. So the lines cross at about $1,125,000. At that point, the marginal rate, the rate on every dollar of, of estate goes down from 40% to like 6%, right? So the people who are really vulnerable are these people that are kind of in the middle. So if you're Frank and Mary, you're looking at estate tax after the second of the two of you have died, has died, of $40,000. The reason why it's the second of the two of you is that when the first of the two of you dies and leaves everything to your spouse, if you leave everything to your spouse, that money gets subtracted from your taxable estate, which is why if one of you dies, there's no estate tax. The issue, though, is if you do that, by do, if you're Frank and Mary, by doing that, you have now thrown away the ability to have given it to somebody else. So if Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary and she dies the next day with a million one, Frank has thrown away the ability that he had before he died to give up to a million dollars to other people other than Mary, right? Or to put the money in trust for Mary's benefit. And that's why the traditional estate tax avoidance mechanism, and you've probably, many of you have probably heard of this, is to create a trust and specify that when the first of the two of you dies, a piece of the assets that would have gone to the surviving spouse instead go in trust for the benefit of that surviving spouse. And in this case, if you're not doing this trust for any other reasons, like to protect the money from mass health, which we'll talk about, in this case, the surviving spouse can actually be the trustee. So Frank can die, say that he's got a chunk of his assets, say $500,000, Instead of having them go directly to Mary, have them specify that the money is going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. Mary's the trustee. She can use the money anytime she wants by pulling it out of trust. But as long as it's structured that way, the money that went into the trust does not become part of Mary's estate when she dies. It is part of Frank's estate when he dies. But as long as the amount that goes into trust is less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. Remember, as long as the estate's less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. So by doing this, Frank and Mary can, can allow their kids to completely avoid the estate tax. And this system works in terms of complete tax avoidance up to estates of $2 million. Because as long as the first spouse who dies puts up to a million into, in, in, into this trust, when the second spouse dies, there's only a million there, and therefore there's no estate tax. Kind of, I don't want you to see the specifics, but you see how that game works? That's what that's all about. So that's the estate tax. Um, now I'm going to jump ahead. Now we're going to pretend that Mary and Frank are 80 years old. And now they have a concern that they really didn't have when they were 65. And that concern uh, results from this. Uh, according to the Alzheimer's Association, uh, if you have a, if you are 65 years old, you, you, the likelihood that you will have a disease that causes dementia, Alzheimer's being one of them, Parkinson's is another, depression actually is another, there are a number of them. Your chances of needing to spend some time in a nursing home are one in nine when you're 65. By the time you're 85, they're one in three. 
The reason for that is if you had something else, serious coronary problem, cancer, blah, 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 you're already dead, right? So the pool of people by the time you're 85 has shrunk a lot. And the remaining people are more likely to hit the disease that really, that, that kind of remains, that really hits a lot of older folks, right? So if you're 80 and you're Frank and Mary, one of your worries is, well, oh my God, what happens if one of us goes to a nursing home? So to understand that, and, and we're gonna assume that those are still their assets, right? They still have a million one in assets, the same list of assets. Now, if that's the situation and Mary needs nursing home care, uh, she, it, she's going to be on private pay, uh, it, uh, not, not more than 100 days after she gets there. If she went to a hospital first and the, stayed at the hospital for at least three days and then got discharged to a nursing home, then Medicare or, uh, or other health insurance will typically cover 100 days in the nursing home, up to 100 days, as long as it can be shown that while she's there, she needs skilled care. Because Medicare only pays for skilled care. It doesn't pay, pay, pays for... You know, heart surgeries and transplants, it doesn't pay for the cost of somebody to help you eat or put on your clothes or make sure you don't walk on into the middle of 495. You know, that's not covered because that's not skilled care. It's the defect in the Medicare system. So as a result of that, after that 100 days, or if, she, if, he, if Mary hadn't started off in a nursing home, immediately when she gets to the nursing home, Mary's going to be on private pay. And private pay is going to cost you around here about $14,000 a month, right? until or unless she can qualify for MassHealth. MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Uh, each state has kind of named their Medicaid programs differently because the rules change from state to state because it's, this is partially funded by the federal government but partially funded by the state. But in Massachusetts, if Mary went into a nursing home, and, and she, could she could avoid a lot of this cost by simply qualifying for MassHealth which means she really wants to know how MassHealth works. So here we go, this is MassHealth 101. MassHealth, if Frank and Mary are alive and Mary needs to qualify for MassHealth because she's in the nursing home, she has to show she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, however, can own the home no matter what the equity, once again, I do a lot of work in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, I got people with $2 million houses and the spouse is on MassHealth in the nursing home, right? Um, they can have other assets of up to $126,420. That's not a whole lot. Frank and Mary have more than that, right? But Frank can also have unlimited income. And so the strategy, if Mary were in the nursing home and wanted to qualify for MassHealth, would be to shift all assets to Frank at that time. There is no look-back period regarding transfers to spouses. So this transfer can literally occur the day before she applies for MassHealth. Frank then, of course, would have too much in assets because he would have more than $126,420. He would use the rest of the money, though, to buy one or more annuities of a very specific kind. What is an annuity? An annuity is a contract between you and an insurance company. You give them money, and they agree in return to pay you back money over some period of time. As long as Frank buys an annuity for a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, uh, and, and as long as that annuity pays equal monthly payments to him during that term and doesn't end when he dies, um, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. Frank can have unlimited income. So the day after Frank buys an annuity that's big enough that the remaining assets are below $126,420, $420, Mary can qualify for mass health. So, a um, couple of issues regarding that as far as Frank and Mary are concerned. Remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets, right? And Frank's got that IRA. So, oh my God, does he have to cash in the IRA? Well, actually, in this case, he doesn't. Uh, you can convert your IRA or other tax-deferred funds into an annuity without that being a, t a taxable event. You will end up, as a result of buying that annuity, getting the money back faster than you would have if you were just taking your required minimum distribution every year. And of course, whenever you've got tax deferred money and you get the money, you have to pay a tax on it. So it's going to increase the speed that you get it back. But, you're, but Frank would not be faced with this huge tax hit because all of a sudden he was cashing in a $300,000 annuity and all of a sudden his income that year went to $300,000 or $350,000, right? And you can buy more than one annuity. So, so if Frank, it would all work with Frank. If instead Frank were trying to qualify for MassHealth, 
and we were shifting all the assets to Mary, there would be a problem. He'd have to cash in his money, pay the tax, then shift to Mary, and then do all the other stuff. So that's one problem. The other issue is that as, a, as of about a year and a half ago, Mass Health instituted a regulatory change which said that in this case, if Frank buys that annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health, Mary's then getting Mass Health benefits, and then Frank dies, either before or after Mary dies. Frank dies, and there are still some remaining annuity payments to be made, because remember the annuity was for a term, some given number of years. Mass Health will have a lien on the remaining annuity payments. So if Frank were doing this, what we would tell him to do, or we would encourage him to do, um, would be to, to, to make that annuity for as short a period as possible, so that he can get the money back in his hands as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's what we'd recommend. And then the other thing we'd tell him to do, although we could do this at any time, and this is what we typically tell spouses to do if they're concerned about this issue in the longer run, is, is if his will said, if Frank's will said, all the assets that I own at the moment of my death are going to go into a testamentary trust, a trust that is part of the will, for the benefit of Mary, she, he could name any one of his kids as the trustee of that trust. And if all the assets were in his name at the moment of his death, all those assets would be safe, non-countable, and non-lienable in the event that Mary was already on Mass Health or ne later needed to qualify for Mass Health. The trustee would have the discretion to distribute some or all of those assets to Mary at any time. And so the assets could be used to supplement Mary's care, or if she hadn't been on Mass Health, you know, to take care of the house. You know, the house can go into that trust, so the house is protected, everything is protected. Okay? So that's the way to protect Frank and Mary. I was going to talk about this, uh, this one case that may have an effect on all of this, but it's a little late, so I'm not going to. Um, I know that you've just loved this, but if you want to see it again, the reason why we're filming this is because the Southbrook Cable Station is kind enough to replay this. Um, so if you want to see this, or if I was talking too fast and you want to slow it down, you know, you can go watch it again. Uh, or you can check out Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. So this presentation and all of mine are on the YouTube channel. Remember, the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. So if you're not worried about this stuff, that's okay, right? If you are worried, though, all I'm saying is there's a solution to any of these problems. You can, you can solve these problems that you're worried about. So thank you very much. I'm glad to answer any other questions afterwards. And we'll see you again, hopefully. Thank you.